This is where the fun begins. Should take like three rockets. Oh, oh, oh. that died so fast. Oh, they did nerf them. Ground Zero has all the characteristics of a video game. Sprites, blood, guns, explosions, but not a single clear identifiable emotion except for pain and despair. Something horrible is happening in this game, and I don't know why. My lust for FPS games is not sated by this experience. I feel boredom on the verge of tears. I think my mask of sanity is about to slip. The year is 1998. Rogue Entertainment is sharing an office with id Software in Dallas, Texas. Being co-located has allowed these two studios to share their DNA. In one form or another, their collaboration would continue for years to come. But today is September 11th, 1998, and Rogue Entertainment is set to unleash their latest creation upon the world. Exactly 107 days after The Reckoning, the second mission pack for Quake 2 was released. Ground Zero. This is not a Quake game. It's a series of torture experiments lined up to form a rudimentary geometric shape that can be successfully navigated as though if one were in a hallway. Every single moment of this game makes me want to die. This is not a Quake game. Gone are the arena battles with wide open maneuverability. Gone are the interesting rooms, diverse colors, and sensible navigation waypoints. Any variation between the levels has been exchanged for endless reps on the boulder of Sisyphus. This is not a Quake game. It doesn't have a single low gravity map in the whole jaunt. Ground Zero has the same accessible gameplay that a coin-operated video game has. You die, you reload, you try again. An endless cycle of death without anything to be truly gained. Like Patrick Bateman says, no new knowledge can be extracted from your attempt except for memorizing the sequence. This isn't inherently bad. I love arcade games, but Ground Zero feels like a misapplication of that sensibility. Once again, we're going to take this journey together and try to extract something new out of my experience. After all, these new environments will challenge even the biggest Quake 2 aficionado. Is that me? It's the third time we're starting with Marines dropping onto the planet. At this point, why would we expect anything different? Suddenly, an energy surge, and the planet's gravitational pull is too strong for the Terran fleet to escape. Our character, Stepchild, is rerouted to take out the generator at all costs. Shut down this channel. Start company. What's unclear is something causes us to crash, and it might be the Strog Fighter. Let's see if we can add some context by referencing the read. Hey, look, a reference to Bitterman. The sultry collision alarm warns us of an impending crash landing. Collision! Collision! Yes, yeah, sultry as hell. This is all just an excuse plot anyway. The story is there, but it's not engaging. Earth has been attacked by some dickheads. Are you a bad enough dude to wipe out an aggressive race on their own home world? It's window dressing for getting you down onto the planet to light up some strog in their own backyard. Our pod descends into the lava, and we've got a typical level one engagement on our hands. Very first thing you think is, this just feels like another Quake 2 map. We've got the lava, we've got the corridors, we've got the brown, and at least we can get my favorite type of levels out of the way early. Two rooms and we get a super shotgun. We've also introduced our first new weapon, the Tesla mine. Imagine a trap from the Reckoning. Now make it useless. This weapon is supposed to deploy and then attack your enemies while serving as an alternate threat, a distraction pulling your enemy's fire. In the original game, you could carry 50 of these, but they were crazy buggy and close to useless since you had to scroll through your entire inventory just to deploy one. The remaster has the weapon wheel, so you can whip them out much easier, but it reduced the ammo capacity to five. We're coming up on one of the first secrets of the game. And the only way to find this one is by destroying this hole in the wall with this chunk of Thalite? Tha-elite? I'm going with Thalite. 
but you can blow it up before it gets to the end of its track, so it's technically missable. What's more frustrating than a secret that's missable? A secret that's not even worth going through the effort to collect. The IR goggles are a new equipment item that makes the screen red. <laughs> My eyes, the goggles do nothing. Another new weapon is the proximity lock. The other new weapon on this level is the Proximity Launcher. Using this in combat essentially translates to a bad version of the Grenade Launcher. It fires motion-activated mines that can also explode on contact with the enemy. It does half the damage of the Grenade Launcher, has a 50 round capacity. At least the remaster changed the behavior of the mines. Stepchild used to trigger his own mines if he got too close, making this weapon a death sentence for the player. I've mentioned how I'm not a fan of using weapon wheels, but Ground Zero is a perfect example of its intended utility. Tons of available weapons and not enough number keys to swap through them. The original version of Ground Zero did not have double binds like in The Reckoning, making every weapon swap to a unique Ground Zero weapon unbearable. We end up fighting through some more lava rooms and then a minecart section to make our way to the Thalite Mines. Our ultimate goal in this unit is to disable the Tectonic Stabilizer, which is keeping seismic activity on the planet within acceptable limits. Presumably this is to allow the Strog to have such an extensive mining operation. Naturally, nothing says winning a war against the Strog like fucking up their resource mining operations. Like there isn't 17 or 18 other steps before they can actually use any of these raw materials. And why do the Strog have such a significant military presence down here? Aren't they currently being invaded in their primary orbital form of defense, the big gun? is currently under siege. Yeah, just based on drop pod deployments, I guess I wouldn't be worried either. In this map, we're on our way to kill a tank commander and retrieve his security pass. Fighting through these mines is tighter than a gnat's asshole stretched over a rain barrel. That's a real saying? People really say that? This type of close quarters fighting is going to be a pretty common theme going forward. Not a ton of interesting stuff going on down in these mines. We do get a chain gun in this area and a grenade launcher, which we're promptly going to use to take out the tank commander I mentioned. As well as our first quad damage in a semi-secret area, Ground Zero definitely doesn't skimp when it comes to the pace of loadout acquisition. And for that, we can be thankful. Somehow in that hail of bullets, we've managed to not hit the security pass we were retrieving, and that allows us to descend further into the complex. Throwing us right into combat, this level introduces our first new enemy, the Stalker. What appears to be a machine spider with a human face. Oh, Jesus! Oh, God! Oh! They have the ability to cling to ceilings, which they use liberally when attempting to kill them with grenades or other slow projectiles. These things aren't too dangerous as long as you remember that they can play dead. Always jib these assholes or you'll be in for a surprise later in your encounter. The primary area here is a lava cavern and we're graced with the presence of a rocket launcher, as well as another new weapon continuing our trend of accelerated weapon availability. This is the explosive tipped flechette or ETF rifle. As far as utility goes, it fits into a strange hybrid slot. It fires projectiles, which prompts enemy reactions like ducking and sidestepping. Its ammo type is unique, so you don't have to worry about it sharing another more useful weapon supply. It's supposed to be useful because it bypasses enemy armor and does damage to an enemy's health directly. In the original game, this isn't much use since you're mostly worried about dying too quickly for this to matter. The remaster gave the bypass ability to the energy weapons, so the ETF rifle can't do anything the hyperblaster can't do better. A great loss for the remaster is that they changed the original sound of the rifle. The nail gun sound effect, which was apparently a straight pull from the original Quake. Big Crush to Hell, which adds charm to this afterthought of a weapon. 
we find a new equipment item called the Defender Sphere. It represents somewhat of a new mechanic for Ground Zero. When activated, it reduces damage done to the player by 50% and fires back at enemies that have hit you, only doing 10 damage per hit. On Nightmare, you can only carry one in your inventory. Personally, I don't find it that useful since you only get four of them in this whole expansion, but it does have an advantage in the final boss fight. More on that later. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Cleaning out this level makes it much easier to complete our objective. Which is to blow up these 16 wall nodes. They start shielded, so we take that out first. Shoot each one. reverse the pump flow to destroy the tectonic stabilizer. This causes a massive cascade failure and we need to evacuate before the whole area is consumed by the planet's mantle. It's a fairly unique sequence and I would call it a highlight of this expansion. But we need to take a detour, wait for this pipe to break and jump over to enter the secret level. It may sound strange, this being a secret level, but I think this is the best level in the game. A ton of work clearly went into the pillars falling over, the terrain crumbling everywhere, and the rising lava levels chasing your escape. It's an exciting sequence, where the claustrophobic level design contributes to the player experience. Plus, this is where you retrieve the novelty weapon. The chain fist is terribly useless in a combat situation, but there's something infinitely charming about getting a chainsaw in a game named Quake. After our harrowing escape, we end up at the lowest area of the Thalite Mines, where we found the quad damage. We fight our way back through the first two levels, along with some liberal compass use, and head up to the warehouse. Not sure if I can call it progress that we're leaving mines and entering a warehouse. Speaking of the compass, did you know Ground Zero had a compass in its original release? Yeah, just use this console command, and you've got yourself a compass. Unfortunately, it doesn't work, a feature that never quite materialized. But clearly, even back in the 90s, somebody thought the player could use some help navigating these games. Up until this point, we've experienced a below average set of Quake 2 levels. Claustrophobic mines with a semi-unique sequence to disable the tectonic stabilizer. But this is when Ground Zero really begins. The turrets. Our primary, most common, and most deadly foe for the rest of the game. This particular variant is the Blaster Turret. Fires a single projectile that does 20 damage and has 240 health, which is the same as the Berserk. That died so fast. So apparently they nerfed the bejesus out of these in the remaster. Only eight damage per shot with 50 health and 50 armor. A single rocket would do the trick now as opposed to three in the original. This does not solve the game's problem as there are still an incredibly large number of turrets in this expansion to deal with. In fact, only one enemy type, gunners, outnumber these wall-mounted momentum killers. At a certain point, it's literally every corner, every hallway, sometimes two or three that pop out of the ceiling after you run into a wall of enemies, cutting off your retreat. We'll meet the other variant later on, but both got this targeting laser added so you can at least know when one was awake and seeking a target. As we fight our way through this expansion, let's uh, count how many of these things are in each area by showing a running total. I think that'd be fun! The Eastern Warehouse is kind of just a much worse version of the train level from the base game, and we find our next new enemy, the Daedalus. It's an Icarus flyer with a shield. Get it? Just like Greek mythology? Anyway. Thankfully, there's a duplicate double damage power-up in this room, so I can just rip everything apart with the chain. As if on cue, we pick up the Hyper Blaster. Now that we know how to beat these shields, we can smash those metal motherfuckers into dust. There's a totally optional area with electrified water near the end of this map. Absolutely no need to turn off the electricity, and certainly no need to grab the IR goggles on the other side. But there is an adrenaline in the water. 
The very last room introduces us to our second turret variant, the rocket turret. Nerfed from 50 damage to 40, these things are still deadly. But I swear, they shoot slower and with lesser accuracy in the remaster. These things used to be able to sense you coming around a corner and react instantly. Our objective is to gain access to the logistics complex. What, so we can do some spreadsheets? Organize the flow of strong supplies? Isolate some pivot tables? I did make an effort to use Tesla mines now that I can access them quickly. One attempt went about as well as you could hope for, and the other was a complete disaster. This level shows what a lot of the game will be like going forward from a pacing standpoint. Start, stop, action in a condensed environment, necessitated by an onslaught of high health enemies and turrets popping out of every damn wall. It's like Back to the Future 3 for Sega Genesis. You can never get a good gallop going as every 10 steps you've got something knocking you off your horse, either above or below. That's this is bullshit. Like The next few rooms have the railgun placed unceremoniously near some standing water, then the BFG and an easily found secret inside this box maze. I feel like when they did this level in Doom, it was cute and charming, but this makes me feel like I'm in an Amazon distribution center, including the sense of impending dread. <laughs> Grab the blue key card, and we can head to the logistics complex. Had to get in two last turrets, didn't you, waterfront storage? Didn't use them while we were in the box maze, so you just put them back in the first available opportunity. Rendezvous at entrance with incoming marine. Okay, video game, whatever you say. In my last playthrough, I started this area with very little health, so these first couple fights are brutal. No room for any mistakes. At the sight of our comrade's untimely crash landing and death, lucky bastard doesn't have to deal with this bullshit mission anymore, we meet one of the deadliest foes in this expansion, the Medic Commander. It can revive corpses just like the medic, but has significantly increased health and has the ability to beam in squads of enemies from nowhere, even gladiators and other medics. Typically, I end up using a BFG shot for these bastards to take them out as quick as I can. That is, if I can hit them before they spawn cannon fodder to jump in front of the shot. This complex is all about getting the tank commander's head. He's just hanging out in the detention area for some reason. Because of the way they've designed the cell block, we don't actually have to fight the commander. Uh, we just need to turn on the security lasers and kill him with those. We crawl into this air vent that's in one of the cells. Raise the bridge and we're heading back to waterfront storage. We fight our way up to the canyon, and we can pass through the security door with our severed head in hand. This secret quad damage is the last one in the game. We will be saving this one for the final boss. As I alluded to earlier, power-ups are critical to victory for that fight, and they interact in interesting ways. Take out the power to the security systems and we can catch a train to the last level of Unit 2. So we exit the train and it looks like we really didn't go anywhere. The brown is strong with this area. Cramped passages punctuate this ambush that seems to keep throwing enemies at us. There's a duplicate double damage that we can use to clear out the next area to our next new weapon. The Plasma Beam, an energy weapon that chews ammo but has a hit scan effect. Let it be known that I have dubbed all weapons with similar firing patterns as the Ghostbuster gun, in honor of a man I once observed at an internet cafe who was screaming at the top of his lungs, FUCKING GHOSTBUSTER GUN! 
after being killed by the Gluon Gun in Half-Life Deathmatch. And because that's basically its entity name in Quake's Cousin. I'm only ever using cells to kill shields, so this gun unfortunately doesn't get much use from me because of its inefficient ammo usage. So after what seems like an eternity of retries through this constant wall of enemies and turrets, we get to finally pick up the data disk and proceed back to logistics. Who decided that this would be a best way to consume this asinine set of level progressions? It's not like these levels are so good that we had to double back to each one twice and see what's behind door number seven, eight, nine, whatever. Square rooms and rounded staircases. That's all there is. That and more medic commanders, more turrets, more Daedalus, more gladiators. It's not engaging, it's not rewarding, it's slowly trudging your way through mud, fighting for every inch of progression. All so that we can realign a dish? <laughs> grab the data disk after it was reprogrammed by our capital ship, and then head back to tactical command. This section doesn't even look like when we were here before, but there is this one cool texture when powering up the communications laser, which is somehow different than the communications satellites that we were just realigning. So, if I'm understanding correctly, this data disk needed an uplink to our capital ship to rewrite its contents with malicious code, then we use a laser to transmit the contents of that data disk back into Strog's systems in order to scramble fighter communication, right? Is that what this diagram is depicting? At least we haven't seen a sewer level yet. Closest thing so far is probably this underwater ammo pack secret right before we take the overflow tunnel to the research hangar. <laughs> I spoke too soon. We're in a sewer. Who named these levels? Did somebody forget to remove the placeholders? I will admit that the look of this map is unique to this expansion and to sewer levels we've seen before this. Of course, we have pipes and water, but they're somewhat creatively arranged, like this first kill box area, which is a little more open. And this secret with the pipe falling down is kind of cool. Gotta make sure we're grabbing as many as possible. Same strategy as the Reckoning, where we're keeping our armor up, and it helps us to keep our sanity in the tougher areas. Initial objective here is to take out an anti-aircraft gun, which we need to do with an airstrike marker from another Marine's drop pod, which is promptly stolen by a gladiator. This is our third airstrike sequence in as many games. We've got the same retrieve the marker objective from Reckoning, but this one doesn't make much sense at all. In the Reckoning, the Gex steal the marker and it sets us on a mission of retrieval, justifying backtracking and pads out the whole unit, including that moment of levity where they're all worshiping the thing, makes the game longer, have more content. Here, we're retrieving the marker, but we're only going like three rooms over and killing a normal enemy. I mean, look at this guy. There's nothing to visually indicate that he has something special. What's the point? Is this because they just didn't want a standard pickup and placement? After removing the gladiator from this plane of existence, we can head to the gun and reprogram it to take out the roof, which was protecting it from airstrikes. That's a neat little environmental destruction sequence. This level seems to have had some love put into it with the pipe break secret and now this. The airstrike lets us retrieve the last weapon of this expansion, the Disruptor. This was cut from the original game, but it has been restored in the remaster. And here we find it just chilling on a bridge next to a drop pod labeled Zor, which is a reference to one of the game's developers. Apparently, it's some kind of merger of human and Strog technology, which fires a ball of energy that targets one enemy only. But it does a massive amount of damage and has a high rate of fire. But its most significant statistic is that it ignores the power shield completely, doing damage directly to the enemy's health. This weapon makes the boss fights winnable. There's no simpler way to say it. We'll cover each of the two bosses as we get to them, but the significance of restoring the Disruptor cannot be overstated. At the end of this map, we find our way into the first wide open outdoor area of this expansion. I had almost forgot Quake 2 is capable of such areas. We try to extend a bridge, but we may have fried the mechanism when we called in the airstrike. So we're forced to progress by using a broken pipe. Just a small, easy little jump over lava. Careful, SpongeBob. Careful, SpongeBob. Uh. So because we fried that bridge, 
allegedly, we've got to find an alternate entrance to the main research hangar. This takes us into waste processing, and our objective is to find our way into waste disposal. This is going to be a fun couple of levels. First area has some diabolical placement of rocket turrets just behind some cosmetic pipes, and apparently they have the same targeting ability as the rocket troops from Control. Enhance Grid 9A. The next few rooms don't get much better as the enemy density increases to its highest point. Every angle, every corner, every ledge has a turret with its own firing angle. Daedalus is just everywhere. And now they're mixing in parasites which do not go down easily and are deadly on night- We turn off some security lasers to get to a pumping reactor. Turn the thing on, and the bastard immediately tries to kill us with radiation. I knew this was coming and escaped perfectly the first time. <laughs> on to opening a few valves to initiate a flow of water and neutralize the lava in the first room. Now we can safely get to the entrance of waste disposal. The Strog must really value their waste infrastructure to have as many turrets guarding it as they do. In fact, to advance through this section, your biometric information must be present in their security database. Thankfully, they have a convenient scanner for those who forgot to go through the proper onboarding procedures at the Strog orientation. It just doesn't take too kindly to human signatures. Two gunners with the absolute worst assignment on the whole planet emerge from a nearby monster closet to respond to this alarm. At least they have a pair of IR goggles in there with them, just in case. Oh hey, they also have the power supplied to the security lasers in that closet. Is it bad that most levels are so uninteresting that these few little areas are somewhat interesting? It's like they took their time with specific rooms, but they forgot how to chain them together in an appealing way. I mean, for a sewer level, it's not so bad. Lots of huge industrial equipment. This level does contain two of the toughest rooms in this expansion, with the exception of the boss fights. One is tough because I have no armor, and there's a hidden medic commander on a ledge. The other is clearly designed to be an arena fight. Multiple elevated enemies with a circular area to maneuver, firing angles changing, going in and out of cover as you circle around it. Ground Zero's twist on this is the spawning of turrets as you hit a certain trigger. At least the targeting lasers give away their position. The original game just started raining rockets on you. Throw in some environmental hazards, which can be used against your enemies, and baby, you got yourself a stoop going. Looking back, this is when I should have used the first invulnerability, as we'll be getting another one soon. But apparently, I love to suffer. I want problems, always! All this so we can disable a force field, break some containment glass to release some gas, and then we can turn on the exhaust fence and blow ourselves into the maintenance hangars. We appear to be back outside. And after dealing with the gladiator welcome party, there's a friend we need to let in. He brought a double damage with him. Thanks, bud. In our first visit to maintenance hangars, we've got to open a door back down in waste disposal. Presumably, that sewer is the secret entrance to the experimental fighter we've been sent to steal. We've spent so long in the sewers that it seems like a far cry from an actual hangar. You know, like where you'd find an experimental fighter. I do like this little bridge with the glass. We jump over and we find some rounds, which is our extremely generic term for disruptor ammunition. We'll be saving as much of that as we can for the bosses. Then there's this hallway specifically built for turrets. That's fun. I suppose this place kind of looks like a hangar. Stealth killing gunners is always satisfying. I'm not sure how he wasn't alerted when I fired over his shoulder to take out that turret. 
Not much else going on, so we open the door and we're told to return to sewer via pipe. Like the world's worst Mario level. Get back into that fucking sewer where you belong, trash. We can now get through the larger waste disposal door in the elevator choke point from earlier. Recognizing the medic commander induces a Pavlov response, equipping the BFG. I don't really even like the BFG. I just want to kill that thing super fast. Back up into the research hangar, where we enter an area where they appear to be filling containers with sludge. Within this assembly line area lies a secret invulnerability, which was so goofy to acquire in the original, it needed changes for the remaster. Also, where is the damn flashlight? The new processing of these graphics make it really tough to see in some areas. The remaster gives it to you in the reckoning, so why not all of the games? Not like it's breaking difficulty of any one campaign. Up some elevators and we're back into the maintenance hangar with less force fields this time. Some congested hallways and even a pit trap. Turrets constantly challenging our progress. Fresh body armor can mean only one thing. Boss Fountain. This game, of course, will do everything it can to bleed off as much of that body armor before our first of two bosses, the carry. The most vital secret in this game comes where many secrets are found in a server room. This one has a power shield, the first time it's available to us in this expansion. I didn't grab this in my playthrough of the original, and you can imagine how that went. You see this? What's in the box? Pain. Temper, silence, silence! Oh. Oh. Pain! No. Enough! Past this door is the actual hangar area for the experimental Strog fighter we've been hoping to acquire. Guarding it is the carrier. 4,000 hit points, with all kinds of weaponry at its disposal, plus spawning in flyers to assist. It's relatively simple to fight the carrier with some expert circle strafing, but if the power shield isn't activated, you won't be able to take even a few hits before dying. The chain gun is the recommended selection in the original game, but the remaster gives you access to the disruptor, which can stun lock the carrier with its knockback property. Well, alright. Having fought this boss in both versions, it's my opinion that they nerfed the carrier significantly by reducing its rate of fire and the spawn rate for the flyers. In fact, I had to cheat in the original game because I didn't have enough ammo to kill it. Furthermore, I wasn't using any power-ups in either version of the fight. When you really boil away the frustrations of this game, Ground Zero comes down to power-up management. If you know what you can collect and where, the game becomes much more manageable, but that knowledge is not forthcoming on your first playthrough, and it likely won't inspire a second. Computer updated. Now I know from experience that leaving this train means close to instant death from multiple turrets. At least we can see the targeting lasers this time. Every corner was like this in the original game. Just don't get too cute and explore the train tunnel looking for secrets. <laughs> That's bullshit. You fucking assholes. We lob a couple grenades onto the promenade level, and we've made it past the first significant hurdle of this map. I feel like with 200 armor and a power shield, we can finally afford to play a little bit more aggressively. We implement a little bit more movement in these slightly wider hallways. The other thing I notice is the use of some different textures in this area. If nothing else, it's refreshing to see a little variety. Too bad this is the shortest unit in the game, but there's going to be a lot of backtrack as we're trying to assemble an antimatter bomb. The idea, of course, is to take out the Strog's ammunition plant. We start our search by getting to the ammo depot. A few more ramps and we're already heading there. That is the final count. 167 turrets in this expansion. Outnumbered only by gunners which have 175 health compared to the turret's original value of 240. That's two railgun shots, three rockets. Either way, you gotta be willing to spend the ammo or you end up dying insanely quickly absolutely punishing amount of enemies to deal with in a short game and short levels. 
Without the remaster's nerfs put in place, this game is almost unwinnable on Nightmare. It does everything it can to make sure that you never see the end. A futile struggle to survive until the quarter you popped in has run its course. But here we are, right on the cusp of ultimate victory. All we've got to do is build ourselves a bomb and we can end this nightmare forever. Ammo Depot starts with an enforcer party. Gotta jib them all to prevent these hit scanners from coming back. Next, we just do a little scooch past the Strog Bio Maintenance Chamber and disable the security locks. Wait, what's a Bio Maintenance Chamber? I guess the only way to find out is to step inside. And apparently we're drowned in goo. Computer updated. And we see that it's given us a Strog Disguise. What a thrill! Uh. Running past idle enemies mid-game makes me feel like I'm cheating. I've never felt so free, so devoid of stress. I can touch them and still not draw aggro. For one brief moment of respite, one slight break from the constant pain, we can just exist without the need for fighting, for killing. A moment of clarity. No way to keep our disguise, I'm afraid. Back to reality and to the munitions plant. <laughs> Here we find ourselves on the other side of the security lasers with a clear path to the upper level. We open the back entrance to the ammo depot, thus initiating the antimatter core creation process, which is using the ore from the mines. That's slightly interesting. Perhaps we've discovered why they put so many soldiers down in those mines. Lastly, we collect a security pass and then return to the ammo depot. We can clean out this level. Then deactivate the security lasers with the pass. Really not sure why they had you bouncing between the two different maps to do these objectives. I suppose it's a creative way to design progression. But did that switch for the lasers really need to be on the other side of the base? Anyway, we're finalizing our antimatter pod and we need to just pull a power cube to drop a containment field. Once more, back to the munitions plant to join the antimatter core and the containment pod we created earlier. Now we have an antimatter bomb. Let's go kill that gravity well. And we need to take a gondola. Can you imagine a Strog riding this thing? Who? How? For what purpose? I understand there's precedent since we saw one in the secret level in the base game, but is there a need for this type of transportation? Some Strog variant that we haven't seen yet? <laughs> At last, we have finally arrived at our ultimate destination. We enter the final level to see one of our comrades in a bit of a predicament. Let me out. Let me out. Wannabol cannot be free. He is doomed to remain in his drop pod prison and will likely be vaporized when we detonate the antimatter bomb. This fight requires game long preparation, as we've alluded to earlier. And with one final boss fountain, we drop into the arena. From the Quake Wiki, the Black Widow Guardian is undoubtedly the most challenging foe in any Quake 2 game. This is not an exaggeration. The Black Widow Guardian can deliver a punishing amount of damage with her blaster and railgun combo. Some maneuvering can get us through the worst of it if we keep our distance and stay out of crowds. Spiders are practically harmless in open arenas, but can overwhelm you quickly if cornered or cut off. 5,000 health plus a 500 point power shield. Damage is reduced by two thirds with conventional weapons against a power shield. So after we bleed that off with the hyper blaster, rockets and railgun can finish the job here, as we'll need to save our truly heavy hitting items for her second form. This monstrosity with the spider legs has 5,800 health, a plasma beam, and a disruptor like weapon, all while the spiders keep coming. Like any boss in Quake 2, this is why we saved our power ups but the Black Widow Guardian has a game-breaking advantage. 
any power-up you use, the Black Widow mirrors it. You use quad damage, the Black Widow Guardian is firing at you with four times the firepower as well. On Nightmare, the power-up is mirrored and comes with an additional power shield charge. Invulnerability is actively working against you on this difficulty. After 30 seconds of not being able to do damage to each other, the Black Widow comes out on top by keeping the additional power shield. There are two things that allow us to win this fight in the least amount of difficulty. The first is that the remaster has allowed stacking of damage values when multiple power-ups are used. A quad damage and a double damage used together are stacked, a feature not present in the original game. The second advantage is the disruptor. This gun completely ignores power shields and does damage directly to health. It has the highest DPS in the game, so with quad and double both enabled, we can use our stockpiled ammo and send this widow back to hell. All that's left now is to plant our antimatter bomb in the gravity well, then arrange for transport off this rock. Command has determined it's best for us to head back to the research hangar and steal the experimental fighter as an escape route. Don't worry about the fact that the ship was never designed to be used by anything but straw. I've planted the charges on the gravity well generator. Inform all remaining ground troops to evacuate. Shit, I'm not going to make it. Death Child Demos, did it work? Hell yes, it worked, Private. We're reporting total destruction of primary target and huge secondary chain reaction explosions all across the planet's surface. Nothing's living on that rock. What about the others? See, that's what I mean about expansion packs not being canon. If the planet was glassed, we'd never have gotten the adventures of Rhino Squad. This is not a Quake game. <laughs> Mother of God Almighty. It's anachronistic torment. This is not the fun kind of out of time experience. We call those boomer shooters. Throwbacks to a time when shooters were simpler, more stylized. In my opinion, more fun. This is what happens when that spirit is corrupted. A game in which any kind of flow is constantly disrupted, overruled by the illusion of challenge. It's memorization, not reaction, not skill. Quake 2 was an extremely well-regarded first-person shooter, set up for success by the original release. As a developer at the time, how do you capitalize on that? More guns, more enemies, new levels. We've seen how the original mission packs failed to live up to what Quake 2 achieved, so how do we assess the remastered versions? What was once a memorable experience, albeit a negative one, defined by a constant and sharp pain, has been dulled by creature comforts. In remastering Ground Zero, Night Dive has created an afterthought. A game that's only worth playing if you're a completionist or a true believer. I played it twice because I happen to be characterized by both. Despite its best efforts, Ground Zero cannot hurt me anymore. I have pierced the veil and there are no more barriers to cross. Its strategies are exposed and its cards laid bare. The winning trick? To endure. This confession has ultimately meant nothing, but I do not see that as a sign to stop. My path is revealed in the rock, chipped away by a thousand cuts. Reckoning and Ground Zero lay defeated in my rearview mirror. I have a feeling that the adventure is just beginning.